Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Biosynthetic Technologies webinar. I'm Mark Miller, the CEO of BT, and with me is... Hi, I'm Matt Creek. I'm the Chief Operating Officer uh, of BT, and today we're going to give you a little background about uh, biosynthetic technologies, uh, some of the technology we have, and some of the properties uh, of those uh, products that we call Estelides. So uh, thanks for taking the time to, to join us, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll kick it off here. So uh, Biosynthetic Technologies is a, is a U.S.-based company that came out of research from the U.S. Department of Agriculture about a decade ago. Uh, a couple uh, uh, enterprising entrepreneurs took that technology and formed a company around it called Biosynthetic Technologies um, and really spent a, a, a good decade essentially developing the process for making um, continuously produced uh, estolides, which we'll talk about here in, in a few slides. Uh, unfortunately, the, there were some capital challenges with, with uh, building a facility of that nature. Uh, and and in, in the interim, a, a company called the Heritage Group uh, acquired the technology and has now launched a, a biosynthetic, te biosynthetic Technologies as a company for producing commercial uh, products really as soon as possible. Now, as part of that kind of rebrand of biosynthetic technologies, we've really kind of created what our vision and our mission is. And, and really, we are laser focused on delivering innovative solutions for a sustainable future. And I really hope at the end of this presentation, we've really convinced you of, of that fact, if we haven't convinced you of anything else. Um, and our mission is really to be a premier synthetic base floor across a variety of specialty markets. And, and what's really kind of cool about our technology is we think it's applicable to a number of different industries and segments from lubricants to personal care, uh, agriculture. Um, it's really got a lot of kind of great applications and, and we'll talk about that. But um, that kind of talks a little bit about who we are, a little history of how we got to where we are. And, and, and now we'll talk about kind of what we're doing uh, with this technology. So the key, the key to our, our technology uh, of kind of creating these, these sustainable base oils is a molecule called an estelide. Uh, and what an estelide is, it's a, it's a secondary ester bond that occurs uh, really kind of the midpoint of a fatty acid chain. To do this, we utilize some type of, uh, whether it be a site of, of unsaturation, say like a double bond in oleic acid, or maybe it's an OH group on a hydroxysteric acid type molecule. Uh, but what's unique is by, by putting that bond in the middle of the molecule and then kind of chaining it together, uh, like you see here, um, it creates a secondary ester. And that secondary ester is far more sterically hindered than a primary ester. Uh, a good example of a primary ester would be actually where our beta group position sits uh, on the molecule. Uh, most esters that are used in group five uh, in the lubricant industry are primary esters. And, and uh, although they're, they're a very unique and interesting molecule, they do have one kind of Achilles heel, and is that that bond is very susceptible to uh, hydrolytic uh, cleavage. So if you, if you have water present uh, in your formulation or through contamination, it can easily hydrolyze uh, that bond, breaking it apart, which creates a free acid, which kind of destroys uh, your product. Uh, estelides uh, still can be hydrolytically cleaved, but they're much, much harder to do because they're protected by kind of being in the middle of that molecule. Um, what's also really unique about our molecules is they're very customizable. So by choosing how many of our fatty acids we stack together, we can tailor the viscosity to a wide range uh, of values from very thin materials to very thick materials. We also have two sites of customization, our alpha and beta positions. And, and we can put things on there that either, uh, say, help improve hydrolytic stability, which is one of our main focuses, uh, or maybe it's uh, better surface chemistries, maybe it's better demulsibility. They're very, uh, very tailorable, uh, depending on what you wanna do. Now, like all things, uh, uh, life's a trade-off. So sometimes when you, you highlight one property, you may subtract from another. In our uh, molecules that we'll be launching and talking about here today, our focus has really been on three key, key areas, and which we consider weaknesses of traditional environmentally acceptable lubricants. Uh, one is hydrolytic stability, which we talked about with a secondary estelide or ester bond. Two is really good oxidative stability. And, and to achieve that, we use fully saturated um, fatty acids uh, as our starting materials. 
and three is very good demulsibility. Uh, and so to get all three of those properties, we use, like I said, those uh, fully saturated um, fatty acids, but we also pick alpha and beta groups that support that uh, from a chemi chemical perspective. So um, now by doing this, we get uh, you know, some really good properties, which we'll show here on, on the upcoming slides. Um, but uh, in general, what, what you see from, from our SLIs, from the versions we've created here is, once again, high oxidative stability. Uh, these molecules, because of the, the fatty acid chains and their chain length, tend to have very low volatility, even at low viscosities, uh, which uh, can be an issue for some low viscosity synthetic base oils like PAOs and others. Um, because they're oleo derived, most oleo um, based uh, lubricants, e even like oils and natural oils, tend to have very high viscosity indexes. And you also see that with our estolides. We talked about it, they have very good hydraulic stability. Uh, and the solvency and detergency uh, of these molecules is really uh, amazing. It's kind of best in class. Um, and what that'll kind of mean from a performance perspective is uh, long lasting lubricants. Uh, very good safety. You can actually reduce the amount of additives you need from a cost optimization standpoint uh, because of these properties. Long-term stability and, and less maintenance for, for the equipment and, and the, the oils you're putting these into. Now, that's more of a performance perspective. The other component of this is that these molecules have a significantly improved environmental performance. And we measure that in a number of ways, uh, which we'll show here. But one, they have very high biodegradability. They don't bioaccumulate in species. Uh, they have very low toxicity, uh, and they have very good bio content. We kind of view those four things as kind of the key areas for, for good environmental performance. And what that means from an environmental perspective is these things break down rapidly if they're accidentally released in the environment. Uh, they have low environmental risk, so wildlife are not going to be hurt or harmed if they accidentally ingest these. And the carbon being used is actually of a renewable nature, making these, these molecules very sustainable. And, and with that, that we, we've been able to achieve a lot of certifications uh, on these products. Mark, anything to weigh in on that? Well, I was just about to mention, Matt, thank you for that. Uh, we've been working very hard at making sure that our, our products are, are capable of certifications. Uh, we've met the requirements of the revised new eco label as well as the USDA bio preferred. Um, it's capable for use in food grade products. So we have the INS and the NSF food grade uh, as a component. Um, our product by itself meets the uh, US EPA vessel general permit requirements. And of course, we're on the LUSC list as uh, safe to use. Awesome. So you know, lots of great uh, uh, environmental and technical benefits uh, to this mo molecule. As I talked about in the introduction, you know, our view is that these products have uh, uses in lots of different areas, food grade applications, industrial applications, uh, stern tubes, uh, like in marine. Uh, we've actually formulated um, uh, API certified GF5 passenger car motor oils. Uh, we, there's actually people researching our molecules and use in pharmaceutical, uh, actually uh, in the area of diabetes. Um, we have personal care applications. Uh, we've actually formulated into tires. We can, we can replace components of process oils with our product and improve winter uh, handling uh, capabilities in those tires. And, and uh, a lot of research around metalworking fluids as well with these molecules. And so this is just kind of a, maybe a tip of the iceberg, but shows that uh, this molecule is not a one-trick pony. It's got capabilities in lots of different industries and segments, and, and really it serves as a platform, uh, I think, for the future uh, as, as a replacement for petrochemical-based type uh, chemicals or products. So here are the uh, initial uh, commercial products available. Um, uh, BT4, BT22, and BT75. Um, those are the viscosity ranges uh, of the product. Uh, also, you can see the bio-based content goes from about 68% uh, all the way up to 94%. Um, the the bio-based content is really being driven by the main fatty acid chain that's being used here. Uh, we are capping with a, a non-bio-based alcohol to give really, really good hydraulic stability performance. 
Um, if we use, say, a smaller chain like an ethanol, we could make 100% bio-based content. Uh, but for now, uh, our goal was to keep the bio content above 60%. Uh, and so obviously as you go to shorter chain links, that bio-based content goes down. When you grow the chain links longer, uh, that bio-based content goes up like you have in the BQ75. Um, and one of, the one of the beauties of having a high bio-based content is that you can make co-blends of non-bio-based products and still end up with a very high bio-based content and certainly high enough for something like the USDA bio-preferred program. And the other uh, great advantage, speaking of, of co-blends, Mark, is, you know, we've chosen kind of discrete ISO grades here. So the BT4 is, a, is a approximately an ISO 22. The BT22 is an approximately an ISO 150. And the BT75 is an ISO 680. If your application requires grades in between, these three products are fully blendable and fully admissible with each other. So you can make an ISO 220 by blending BT22 and BT75. If you want to make, say, an ISO 46 hydraulic fluid, you'd, you'd blend the BT4 and BT22. They're fully blendable. They're very solvent. And so that allows you to create um, cuts of kind of any viscosity of interest in between those two. Here's the, uh, the, the properties of the base oils themselves. Uh, so you can see at 100, uh, the viscosity is approximately 4, 22-ish, and 75, uh, plus or minus uh, a couple centistokes there. Um, that's how obviously we name our products is based on that the KV at 100C. Uh, as I talked about these isograids, the kinetic, uh, kinematic viscosity at 40 is actually closer to 21, 22 for the four, about 140 to 160 for the 22, and about 680 for the 75. Um, we talked about very high viscosity indexes. Uh, the, the lowest VI is 150 with the BT4, and we're approaching 200 with the BT75. So obviously, if you're formulating with these, you're not going to need VI improvers in your final formulation, which, uh, which can help from a cost perspective. Um, they have acceptable pore points, uh, usually in the low minus 20s. Uh, uh, once again, this is an area we can customize around uh, for future iterations. But in, in this case, we wanted to at least kind of get that minus 20, which we view as, as, as initially acceptable uh, for a number of applications. Um, they have very good flash points. This is close cup uh, flash points. So usually uh, 240, 250 is kind of the start point as a minimum. And, and we've seen even higher that we've measured up to 290 on the BT75. So, so very good uh, flash point, which goes to that kind of that concept of volatility. Um, we make sure all of our S slides start with very low acid numbers. Uh, obviously acid number is important when, when uh, it comes to these types of ester products. The more acid you have in there, the more likely for that hydrolytic cleavage. So we start with very low acid numbers to, to help protect the molecule as well. Uh, good colors, uh, usually one to two for the, the D1500 ASDM method. Uh, obviously, the thicker you get these, a little darker they get, just from the chemistry and, and, and some of the catalysts and technology we employ. Um, keep it very low water. Uh, and then here's those NOAC values we're talking about from, from volatility. We actually don't measure a, a NOAC on the BT75 because there's essentially nothing, nothing really coming off at these temperatures. But even the BT4, uh, which is a relatively thin uh, 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 viscosity grade, only has a NOAC of about eight. And so like applications like passenger car motor oils and others where this is really important, that's a great number uh, for, for helping support the uh, formulations with that. And as expected, uh, all of these molecules are essentially shear stable. Uh, there's not a lot to shear uh, on how these, are, uh, these molecules put together. So you'd expect good shear stability, and that's what we see uh, in, in these molecules. Um, real quickly, uh, those are kind of the, 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 the base properties. We, we want to talk a little bit more about the environmental properties uh, of these S slides in detail. But one thing we like to just kind of uh, help remind folks of is, is you know, we view biodegradation as a really important characteristic, and so does the industry. A lot of the requirements around VGP and eco-label and other um, requirements are really set around biodegradability. But there's a lot of uh, people that use this term loosely in the, uh, in, in the industry, and, and we just like to make sure people understand what the different classifications of biodegradation really are. So to be a readily biodegradable product, uh, you have to break down greater than 60% in a 28-day window. But in addition to that, within a 10-day, so once your primary biodegradation has started, you actually have to reach that 
in um, that 60% within 10 days. Now, that doesn't mean from time zero. So a lot of times it takes maybe four or five, even 10 days for kind of biogradation to get going. But once it gets going, you have to actually break down greater than 60% in a 10 day window. And that has to happen entirely within 28 days. Ultimately kind of removes that 10 day window restriction. You just at the end of 28 days have to be at least 60% biodegraded. Inherently biodegradable is products that are from 20% to 60%. Uh, you, you see this uh, term used a lot, uh, inherently biodegradable. Uh, so if your product just barely passes that 20% threshold, a lot of people will say they're biodegradable when they're really just inherently biodegradable. Uh, and you can, once again, this can be very low product breakdown, still kind of get this classification. And obviously anything that doesn't break down greater than 20% is labeled as non-biodegradable. So uh, just kind of a, a term definition. So for, for our BT products, uh, the biodegradability, which we measure through the OECD 301B test, um, are all very high. The BT4 is 88%. Uh, the BT22 is 79%, the BT75 is 76%. The BT4 actually is that top tier, it's readily biodegradable. Uh, the BT22 just barely misses it by a day or so, and then the BT75 is uh, um, obviously doesn't quite get there, it's a little bit lower. That makes sense from the size of the molecule. Usually the bigger the molecule, the more the bugs kind of got to work to chew it up. Um, so a lot of times these highly viscous, highly thick materials can be challenging to get biodegradable as above 60%. And you can see here, we, we, we achieved that very readily with that 76% of, of biodegradation. So it's an ultimately biodegradable uh, molecule. Um, you can see the bio contents as well. Uh, the other thing you have to measure in order to, to meet, uh, say, um, equal label requirements and some of the VGP is, is even though it's biodegradable, the things that biodegrade can't be toxic. So these molecules can't be toxic to the species uh, uh, that they may be released into. Obviously, water is a, is a really big uh, item. So we, we tend to measure a lot of the um, uh, algae, daphnia, fish, bacteria that you find in, in these water, in these ecosystems. Um, and you think about VGP, which is a lot of marine applications, obviously water contact here is very important. Uh, so we run the OECD 201, 202, 203, 209. To, to get equal label requirements, you have to be better than 100 ppm or 100 uh, milligrams per liter. We test at 10 times those limits. So, uh, and what you see is uh, greater than 50% of all these species survive uh, even at 10 times the limit. Uh, we actually don't see really any species kill significantly. So we believe we could run it at 10,000 and probably still pass these results. Uh, eventually, the fish are actually swimming in oil versus water, so there is a limit here. Uh, but um, we just want to show at least that we're 10 times uh, the limits required and still provide no toxicity issues, uh, making these very safe uh, uh, if they were, say, accidentally released uh, into the environment. So we've got good biocontent, we've got great biodegradability, and we have phenomenal toxicity. So we really believe from an environmental perspective, um, they have a fantastic performance. So um, just a little more detail on some of our certifications. Mark did a really good job of kind of laying out where we are. Um, regulatory wise as well, um, we have uh, achieved uh, TOSCA, US registration of our BT22, BT75, and we are currently limited to 10 tons uh, of BT4. That process is almost done so that we'll be able to do unlimited uh, materials in the US on the BT4. We are approved in Canada. Uh, we are approved REACH for all three products. Um, so that basically most North American and European markets, uh, these products are available from a regulatory uh, standpoint, both in, uh, um, you know, for lubricant type use and in personal care space. Um, all three products are on the LUST list, which means they're available for equal label formulations. Uh, we, we can make bio-preferred claims uh, against these. Uh, it is uh, somewhat uh, formulation independent. Uh, but in the case, uh, we actually have a, a certified bio-based, bio-preferred uh, product in our engine oils, which we'll talk about. And as Mark said, uh, we have um, HX1 certification, both from INS and NSF, although uh, one distinction now is NSF recently has purchased INS, so they're kind of all NSF classifications now. And our, our BT75 was the final product to be certified under uh, INS. Uh, so as a, I don't know if that gets us in Guinness or not, but uh, a unique 
a new character there will be the last, but both of them are HX1 so that these can be used in food contact applications, say like on, on you know, uh, conveyor belts and other materials that are used in the food processing industry. So, so you know, putting all this together now, so we've talked about the, the performance of these molecules, we've talked about the environmental, but if you remember, our, our really focus was uh, around sustainability, you know, uh, innovative solutions, sustainable um, is really what we're, we're all about. And, and so what we've done is, is we, we've looked at the whole kind of circular sustainability of the BT products, how they work, how they're manufactured. Uh, obviously, um, because you're starting with an agriculture and oleo-based product, when you're making an SLIs, there's a lot of benefits because uh, those oleo chemicals act as carbon sinks, so they're, they're essentially carbon negative. But if you're manufacturing in a way where you're burning lots of CO2 and you're very resource intensive, you're very energy intensive, you can chew up a lot of those gains. Um, and then there's other aspects to sustainability just besides carbon. I mean, there's, there's, there's lots of things you want to think about. Water, NOx, SOx for air pollution, TDS, COD for, for water pollution. You want to think about how uh, the products are harvested, how they're used, what kind of uh, socio and economic impacts. And so in that regard, we did a whole kind of life cycle assessment of our manufacturing uh, process. Um, and the way we looked at that was uh, raw materials, how we manufacture, uh, that process in manufacturing, and then how we eventually handle those materials uh, from start to finish. Um, now we, uh, for our initial molecule, uh, have built it around the caster plant. Um, we like caster. Uh, caster has a number of, of, of positive attributes. Um, and it's, it's, it's really sustainable because one, it's not competing with food. So you're not displacing uh, uh, food or other products that may be grown on the land. It's really only, the land that's used is really only suitable kind of for growing caster, kind of of the lower quality, if you will. It doesn't need as much water, so it can be grown in kind of semi-arid regions as well. Um, and it, uh, it can also be, what's nice about it is that if you plant it once, and, and depending on how good the growing season, you can get multiple harvests out of the same plant. Um, I think in like best of times up to six harvests uh, of the castor product. So, um, and also what's nice about castor is um, there's been a lot of genetic modification on plants, especially in the oleo world to, to basically try to um, get the purity of certain types of chemicals that come out uh, really, really high. Castor has this unique property of that, uh, you know, 85 to 87% of the molecule is already of one type of fatty acid, which is ricinoleic acid. Uh, for example, if you look at soybeans, soybeans naturally have like 60%-ish or sometimes less of oleic acid. With genetic uh, modifications, we've been able to get that up to closer to 70%. But ideally, uh, for oleochemicals, you want really high purities. You'd want something close to like 100%. Um, 87% for, for castor is amazing. So what's good about that is you don't need to have GMO to get the high purity. And so castors had no GMO work really done to it. And so that means our products are GMO free, which, which is a, another great aspect of that. So um, what's also nice about castor in India is, is this, this castor industry has been very well um, put together, uh, especially from a CO2, but also from a cost standpoint. So that means that where it's grown, where the products crushed, processed and shipped is kind of integrated in, in kind of one uh, geographic region, which really helps minimize the impact of CO2 use. You're not moving this, this plant or this molecule to all these different parts of the world back and forth and consuming CO2 in the process. It's a, it's a well-integrated kind of supply chain to produce these. Um, uh, our product, uh, at one of the facilities we're using in India to, to toll manufacture this product is, is, uh, is really 100% renewable energy. Uh, electricity, electricity is driven from a local wind farm. And then uh, especially for the chemical reactors that are powered by heat and steam, to do that, they have boilers. And traditionally, boilers are, are fired by you know, natural gas or oil or some other product. But uh, at this facility in India, we're actually firing the boilers using the, the spent cake from the seed crushing process. So I talked about that kind of the integration. This is where you really get some impact out of that. Uh, and, and by doing that, you essentially are really providing renewable energy to all the different components uh, in that facility. 
And if you look at that and put that all together, what that means is for every um, metric ton of our product, about um, negative or about nine tons of carbon is actually absorbed. So that means is the product actually so shows up to you as a customer, you know, uh, in a negative carbon state. Now that carbon state will change depending on how the product's used, uh, what, how the formulation is eventually disposed of. It could be neutral, but it, but from cradle to gate or cradle to crate, we're actually in a negative state, uh, uh, you know, showing up to the, the user of the product. Mark, any, any comments around our sustainability uh, life cycle assessment? As, as Matt said, you know, the bar to sustainability has been increased dramatically over the, over the, over the, the time, time frame. And uh, we're really proud to be able to bring carbon negative products to your gate, uh, which you can use for part of your sustainability in initiatives, or you can pass them through to, uh, to your customers for their sustainability initiatives. So we're continuing to press for all the various types of uh, sustainable activities and, and use best practices wherever possible. Yeah, and, and you know, Mark, it's important to point out, we've kind of focused a little bit on carbon here, but you know, also things like NOx, SOx, COD, those are all important. And, and we're, we're happy to share, uh, share that data with, with anybody of interest. Because when we did the life cycle assessment, we tried to think of it as broadly as possible from an from a, a impact point of view. All right, so now, um, now that we've kind of hopefully convinced you that we've got this, uh, this good performing environmental performance, we've got good technical performance, we've got um, good sustainability, now we want to show some of the kind of the properties of this molecule and, and, and maybe why you'd want to use it, say, in a lubricant formulation. Um, so first is, um, these are all like uh, different base oils uh, that you see in front of you here. Uh, group ones, twos, threes, which are Obviously, uh, you know, mineral oils are, are, are derived from crude oils. Uh, we've looked at um, other group fours and group fives, group fours like PAO. So we have low viscosity and high uh, viscosity PAOs. And then group five, which are also synthetic uh, derived molecules, which are things like esters, uh, PAGs, and, and estylides. Um, the first thing we've looked at here is uh, solvency, uh, measured through analyme point ASTM uh, D611 uh, methodology. And, and this is a good indicator of how solvent uh, your molecule is. So things like how well will the additives blend into your formulation or can you help blend things together with your good solvency? You know, PAOs and group three um, mineral oils tend to have a ch some solvency challenges. And so a lot of times they'll need to use more solvent things like esters uh, to help blend in say additive packages. Um, and, and, and so obviously the higher the aniline point in, in temperature, the less solvent you are, the lower the aniline point, but kind of the more solvent you are is a way to think about this, uh, uh, this chart. And, and you can see, so PAO, group three, group twos are kind of, uh, are the most challenged from a solvency standpoint. And then as you go more towards some of these synthetic molecules, especially around polyols and then diesters, um, and then PAGs, uh, you can see that the, the, the solvency is improving. Um, you know, our 75 product is what you'd see is, is similar in, in solvency to what you'd see with kind of some of the um, low viscosity polyol esters um, and, and PAGs. And then if you look at our BT4 and BT22 product, uh, they're essentially quote unquote off the chart here or almost below the chart because uh, they're so low and, uh, from an aniline point. What that means is they're very, very solvent uh, molecules. And so even at small treat rates, even if you're not using the S slide as the main component of your base oil, um, small treat rates will dramatically increase the solvency of your formulation, helping, you know, solubilize additive packs and other molecules. Uh, so this is a kind of a really great property uh, of the estylide uh, base oils themselves. One of the other benefits, Matt, um, if the low, of the low aniline points is the ability to keep uh, finished products and the equipment that it's used in uh, very, very clean because it absorbs varnishes and sludges and things like that. And we'll see some examples of that when we discuss motor oils in a little bit. So um, now I made some claims at the beginning around um, what we've optimized for uh, with these molecules. And um, so uh, the big one, like I said, though, that we focused on was really around hydrolytic stability. We, we view this as uh, a weakness in 
some of the conventional environmentally acceptable lubricants. Uh, obviously, uh, hydraulic stability for things like PAO and uh, traditional um, mineral oil based like bright stocks, bright stocks, paraffinics, and uh is usually quite good. It's not something you have to worry about, but with esters and others, uh, you have to. There's a couple of methods you can use to, to measure hydrologic stability. Um, ASTM D2619 uh, is, is one of those. This is usually a 48 hour test. Uh, we've modified it to 144 hours, once again, to try to highlight uh, some of the capabilities of estalides. Um, and really the number you're looking for is the, the kind of the change in acid number and the total acidity of the water layer uh, for, for these. Um, once, once the acid gets above about five, um, you tend to have, you're having significant problems probably with your formulations. Um, and you're really, really looking for is also, you know, is that acid number changing over time, which means the molecule is kind of breaking down. Uh, traditional esters, which we'll talk about here in a second, um, usually fail this test uh, right after 48 hours or close to 48 hours um, and wouldn't survive a 144-hour test. Here you can see the estalide basically is performing identical to PAOs and bright stocks kind of in this, this time domain. Um, so based on this view, we, we, we feel that we actually have a hydrolytically stable molecule, although this really wasn't kind of good enough for us. Uh, so to, to better simulate some of the, the conditions you might see in, in, in a finished formulation, um, and, and you know, actually in a, in a field type trial application, we kind of create this hydrolytic stability torture test. So we'll take the, the sample, we'll mix it with about 1% uh, water uh, by weight, the sample. We heat it to 180 uh, degrees Fahrenheit and maintain it at 180. And then we stir continuously at 500 revolutions per minute. And then we sample these products uh, kind of on a weekly basis to look at their, um, uh, their tan over time as a measure of kind of that hydrolytic stability. And what we've done is we've done this for kind of once again that initial like that set you saw with the solvency data. So group threes, PAGs, PAOs, esters, and, and esalides. And uh, you can see kind of from our chart here um, that you know the, the, the PAGs, the group threes, and the PAOs as you'd expect is we're not seeing a lot of change uh, in, in tan, uh, and that's expected. These are all hydrically stable, and I think that verifies that the method is kind of reproducing what it should. Now, on the bottom here, if you look at some of the esters, in this case, we've used complex esters, we've used polyol esters, we've used diesters. Um, well, we didn't do any monoesters just because I think uh, they, they'd probably fall apart so far we couldn't get them to test. But what you can see here is these dramatic changes in tan with time. And, and uh, this, once again, this is kind of indicative of what you see with kind of primary ester bonds is they're very susceptible to hydrolytic uh, cleavage and, and you, you see a, a rapid rise in tan. Now compare that with the BT products here is you can see there's almost no change uh, in our tan over the first four weeks of this product. They're essentially flat on the baseline like uh, the PAGs, PEOs, and group threes. And so based on this uh, data, what we feel is uh, through the secondary um, ester bond and through that low initial tan uh, that we produce in, in the molecule, uh, these products are much more hydrogenically stable than competing esters that are commercially available on the market um, and, and, and have really helped uh, in, in, this, in this area. So, uh, so I think this uh, this very, very good, very strong data that, uh, uh, from a performance perspective, uh, we've definitely got uh, the right uh, the right parameters here for our molecules. Now, the the other thing we talked about was, um, especially you think about uh, uh, the the product life of a finished formulation. Uh, there's a couple things that can that can destroy that. Hydrolytic stability obviously is one of them. The other one is is oxidative stability. Um, you know, a lot of times. Uh, a little bit of trained oxygen or others, they get in there and they start kind of, they can chew these molecules up. So oxidative stability also is gonna help your overall uh, life of your, your end formulation. And, and so we tested against, once again, the kind of same component of, uh, of products. And now here you see a kind of different result, whereas uh, uh, in hydraulic stability, PAGs tend to be very good. Uh, PAGs tend to be lower oxidatively stable than say uh, group threes or, or some of the lower viscosity PAOs. Uh, uh, LV, low viscosity PAOs used to kind of be like the gold standard for, for oxidative stability. 
Um, there are some bigger issues with high viscosity PAOs. They tend to be lower. And then esters, esters can kind of be both good or bad, depending on whether you're using fully saturated or, or, or unsaturated esters. And here again in the data, once again, you see that group threes and low viscosity PAOs have very, very high oxidative stability as measured by the ASTM D2272 um, RVPOT test. Um, and also in the data, as expected, you see kind of a lower drop uh, in these PAGs. And I should point out all of these materials are treated with the exact same antioxidant package. This is a half percent phenolic, half percent uh, aminic antioxidant. Um, you know, this is just the exact same uh, for comparison. Well, it wasn't optimized for any specific molecule, but just kind of show a level playing field. Um, and then you see a drop uh, in the high viscosity PAOs. Uh, the esters uh, showed, uh, you know, the complex ester here obviously must be using a, 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 a um, double bonds in it, probably oleic acid type derivatives. And, and the, the pentaerythrol ester used here, um, probably fully saturated. So uh, a decent number. But uh, what's interesting is the estylides, uh, which are, uh, you know, environmentally acceptable type base oils are actually competing very, very well with what you see in group three and PAOs, uh, kind of similar type class performance. And once again, uh, most of that we believe is by using fully saturated um, uh, fatty acids as our base stocks and some of that alpha and beta chemistry and customization of the molecule. So once again, I think this, this shows that these are very, very stable from an oxidative uh, um, stability standpoint and, and can provide a lot of benefits for that, that end use formulation. So. Um, we've also measured some performance properties uh, on these molecules, uh, mainly how do they perform kind of uh, from like a wear. So if you're using them uh, in, a, in a finished formulation, do they, do, they, do they behave like normal base oils? Do they, you know, how do they interact? We've measured it for our products along with some PAOs and some other kind of traditional um, mineral uh, based uh, like bright stocks. Uh, what's interesting here is, is our BT75 uh, product uh, has a very, very low uh, anti wear. Actually, some of the, one of the better ones we, we've measured. The, the four and the 22, uh, the smaller size, are, are, um, are, are, are obviously higher. You see that same trend with uh, PAOs, the, obviously, the thinner. The molecule kind of the less wear capability it has. But what's interesting is uh, our BT22, uh, which is an ISO 150, has about the same wear properties as a, as a ISO 460 uh, for PAO. Um, and then our 75 is actually slightly better than even a 1000 for a, for a PAO. All uh, dramatically outcompete kind of the traditional uh, mineral oil base. So what's interesting about that is 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 the in this case the molecule actually in, it provides additional wear enhancement. Uh, especially if you're using some of the high viscosity uh, BT products. And when this, once again, what this would mean is, is you could reduce the amount of anti-wear uh, additives you're using in the final formulations. Uh, for and, and Matt, let me, let me add in here that uh, these are unadditized. These are strictly the base oils, and this is the performance that they got. Exactly right. So, so this is just the, the base oil all by itself. Uh, thanks for pointing that out, Mark. So, um, and then to kind of wrap up the, the just talking about the base oils themselves, the other thing we've done is we've run um, elastomer compatibility. Obviously, this is very important for in-use formulations. This is 100% uh, base oil with nothing else in it uh, on a, a number of different conditions. So this is for all three, the four, the 22, and the 75. We've tested nitriles, polyacrylates, floral elastomers. In general, what we see is very good compatibility with, with, with all these products. Um, We've also done uh, NBRs, HNBRs, and some other molecules and finished formulations. And in general, what we see there is, uh, because of the good solvency, like you see this with other esters, is our low viscosity products tend to act uh, similar to what you, what you see in, in esters, and our higher viscosity products actually act a little bit more like PAO in that they, they can actually harden some of the NBRs and HBRs because of their size. Uh, they actually can't get into the rubber instead of pulling stuff out. So very normal behavior uh, for, uh, for base oils. They tend to be very compatible. And so what this means is you can, you can use our estylides in a variety of formulations and end-use applications because they have good compatibility with, with all these various elastomers. So, so uh, just kind of wrapping it up uh, real quickly, uh, talking a little bit about um, 
uh, the, the overall properties of these base oils themselves. We talked about kind of the physical properties, you know, the good viscosity index, good flash points and no acts, very low starting total acid numbers. Um, and uh, we've talked about the environmental properties. Uh, sorry, Mark, did you have some? No, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, the good environmental properties of the molecules, so they're highly biodegradable, they have good bio content, and they have exceptional toxicity. And then some of the performance capabilities. So uh, the, the four ball wear, uh, there's actually some, some weld load data and load wear index on these. Uh, what's interesting is the BT22 and 75 uh, have weld loads that are kind of at the bottom tier of starting uh, finished formulation. So they, they also have good weld load capability. Uh, these molecules are very oxidatively stable. Uh, they have uh, very good hydraulic stability, uh, uh, low low tan uh, as measured uh, by that ASTM methodology. So you put it all together and, and you have what I would consider a very environmentally acceptable base oil that has great performance characteristics uh, for your end use formulations and has solved some of the kind of Achilles heels and challenges of some of the more traditional environmentally acceptable lubricants like primary esters or, or vegetable oils. Um, Mark, any, any comments on kind of the, on the big picture of, of Esalides? I think you've done a great job explaining that all, Matt. I think it's the perfect, perfect intersection of performance and sustainability and can be used in a wide range of applications. Um, one thing real quickly to point out, and, and I think if, if you're really interested in this, that we have some other talks you're welcome to listen to by our, um, our, our, our division head, uh, Jake Bredsgard. We have launched uh, a personal care division within BT. Uh, we have three products that are also estylide derivatives. These are bioestylides, uh, bioestylide 30, bioestylide 250, and bioestylide 1300. Uh, it's a plant-based emollient, uh, lots of really good properties as well. Um, and I really encourage you, if interested, to, to jump on our website and, and listen to uh, our talks around kind of the personal care applications uh, of these molecules. So if you do want to follow us, there's, there's a lot of great ways of staying connected. Uh, we have a great LinkedIn profile, which we keep updated. Uh, we we uh, also put stuff out on Twitter of what's happening. Uh, we have a nice updated website. It has all kinds of information on it. Uh, uh, the website also has a blog where we, we write uh, white papers and other articles, um, kind of share some of the new R&D efforts going on. We talk about some of the uh, conferences we'll be attending, ways of seeing us, and we also have some of these kind of webinars and other video information. So lots of ways of staying kind of connected to us. Uh, and, uh, you know, from that, I just want to basically say thank you for your time uh, listening to us. And I, I hope uh, in the course of this, uh, uh, this, this lecture by Mark and, and myself that we've convinced you that we're really delivering innovations for a sustainable future. Uh, Mark, anything else to add? No, we appreciate your time and attention and hope uh, you reach out to us and uh, see if we can help you with your formulations. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks a lot, everybody. everybody.